Hi, we're here in Durban, South Africa, a venue of this year's important UN Climate Summit. It's the first week of these talks and I've got Louise Hand, Ambassador for Climate Change for Australia and Australia's lead negotiator at these talks. So first of all, thanks for making the time as always to meet with us. It's, it's much appreciated. Right, my pleasure. Uh, yesterday, Louise, you spoke proudly about the recent passing of our carbon price legislation in the opening plenary. How are other countries receiving this historic first step of Australia in tackling climate change? And has this increased our position in the negotiations at all? All right. So you, um, you heard me speaking proudly about our carbon uh, legislation. Well, that, that's simple, you know, because we are extremely proud of this development in Australia's um, history. It's a profound economic reform. Um, it takes account of the intergenerational equity aspects of the way we live in Australia. Um, it will contribute our full and fair part to global efforts to keep the temperature rise to um, the guardrail of two degrees or less. And it really will prompt um, a very significant change in Australia's thinking on things like renewable energy. Um, what other countries have found is that a price on carbon is a considerable incentive in the market to change behaviour. And it's a crucial first step for Australia in reducing emissions over time. So, and, and as you know, this is something the government has worked very hard at and has built up um, very strong coalitions of interest and tried to take account of all the affected parties in the most constructive and long-term way. And uh, as I said when I um, spoke to this yesterday, we're always looking for good news in climate change world and this is a very it's a very good um, legislative practical step that will uh, help Australia meet that target that we've set and in terms of what other countries have um, the responses one of the first responses we had was from uh, the secretariat who one of the people in the secretariat who's been following this for a thousand years and he said that he thought that it was a great statement and it had transformative content. So in, in this world where we look closely at the action of others, something like this does have the power to transform the way other countries think and it will be very interesting to see over time whether or not um, it, it's helped with the, with the general momentum. But the initial reaction is, is overwhelmingly positive. Yep. Great. This next question is from Ros Lewis in Launceston who, when sending this question, said that she almost feels like your friend. She's had so many questions sent in to you, Louise. <laughs> Ros asks, is there a different mood here at the COP in Africa, given the sense of urgency and some of the problems that people in Africa are facing due to changing weather patterns and extreme weather events? And is there a different sense of urgency in terms of acting around the Kyoto Protocol and around the Green Climate Fund? And does that make you sometimes feel that Australia's quibbles are less sort of relevant than some people in Africa's might be? Uh, look, the, an African COP, of course it is, and hello Ros in Launceston, <laughs> I'm glad you keep asking questions. Um, the COP in Africa, it, it has a particular focus on adaptation and the effects of um, climate change on the most vulnerable developing countries, absolutely. And this is at the forefront of our Minister's mind when uh, one of the aspects of Australia's fast start funding is that it has taken account of uh, much of this issue in Africa and we're proud of that. Um, I think one of the sort of, uh, so far, it, one of the things that's slightly disappointing is this focus on the Kyoto Protocol second commitment period because the second commitment period of the Kyoto Protocol of the Annex 1 countries who have indicated that they're able to do it under the current circumstances won't do much for Africa at all. Um, in order to get the significant emissions reductions globally, you have to reduce emissions where they occur. and. Uh, most of the Annex 1 countries, the Annex 1 countries are on tack, uh, track as a, as a group to meet their targets under the Kyoto Protocol, but since that was first negotiated over in, in 1992, the world has changed quite dramatically and we really, really need, if we're going to have any impact on Africa, we really need to get those major emitters in, in whatever way works for them, um, but in a much more binding and long-term strategic way than they currently are. So if anything, I'm a little bit sad that the prism through which uh, emissions reduction is seen is so narrow and it doesn't matter you know, how hard that group of countries try it can't happen on our own. We have to get, it, it, Kyoto Protocol covers almost only around 17% of emitters, but the Copenhagen pledges and the Cancun pledges cover much, much more, between 80 and 90%. Okay. Jesse Wells from Queensland, University of Queensland, UQ asks, 
In light of the rapidly growing evidence of changes in our climate and extreme weather events and projections by the International Energy Authority recently that to limit warming to less than two degree target is going to require drastic action within five years, is Australia pushing for a new legally binding agreement to be signed by 2015 to be enforced by 2020 and should we be pushing for a more ambitious timeline for around a legal agreement? Uh, look, what um what is her name? Jessie. Jessie, yes. Uh, what Jessie describes is, you know, a kind of ideal aspirational mm -hmm. world. And, and we would absolutely, you know, if, if we could line up all those major emitters, the top emitters globally, and sign them up to something with a timeline and, you know, commitments and verification in that timeline, it would be, uh, it would be a remarkable thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's not on the cards at the moment. It just can't be done. Those major emitting countries are not yet ready to do that. The best we can do, and we're doing it, is build on those building blocks, every single one of the building blocks that it will take to pull together one day into a global agreement mm -hmm. and get those as functional and operational and as it, with you know the best sort of governance and credibility as we yep. possibly can. That's our best hope for emissions reductions. So in terms of Australia's timeline, Global agreement to be negotiated starting in 2015. By when would it likely to be happening? Well, it doesn't. You know, we're, we're just one player in this, yeah. so it'll be what we can get agreement mm -hmm. to. Okay. Um, it, it really depends, not so much on us, uh, mm -hmm. but on what those other. It's who's in it. Yeah. You know, uh, if you want. Um, the big emitters in it. We have to take account of the timelines that they can do legislatively. Okay. Yesterday Oxfam and the International Chamber of Shipping, which represents over 80% of the industry, called on delegates here at COP17 to give guidance to the International Maritime Organisation to reduce emissions and also to think about a levy on shipping emissions. My question to you Louise is, I'm wondering what Australia is doing around negotiations for a levy on shipping emissions here at Durban and what flexibility are we taking into account and how are we sort of compromising on this really important issue? Uh, well, obviously, bunker fuels, um, maritime and aviation, are growing exponentially. Um, and we would like to see that resolved. We've had a recent, um, recent development in, I think, the IMO, uh, which um, looks slightly more prospective than anything we've had before. Uh, I, I, I would say that there are very few governments right now mm -hmm. that would be ready to um, be party to a global uh, tax on bunker fuels. But you know, when you look at the sources of potential finance, climate finance, mm -hmm. it's hard not to see that most governments will have to do a critical examination of that. Yep. And it's, um, and it's, I suppose, um, viability. But it's mm -hmm. definitely one of the things on the table. The Australian government doesn't yet have a coordinated position on it. Um, but it is one of the things that was in the Secretary General's report. Yep. Um, and will be up for consideration. Yep. Okay, the next question comes from Jeff in Carlton who writes, Louise, I want to see Australia keep Kyoto alive. It's the only legally binding group to tackle climate change. I think it's important. What do you see as being the most likely outcome around Kyoto and what role is Australia ensuring the second period, a second period of Kyoto comes into being? Well, I, I can understand why um, I can understand a sort of sentimental attachment mm. to the only existing uh, legal treaty, but it's not much use on emissions, I'm afraid. So we're really looking at other ways of um, drawing together uh, countries' commitments on their on their emissions reductions, and that really absolutely has to start with domestic action and domestic mm. legislation that the rest of the world can observe and see and reassure themselves is being done. So those are the sorts of things we're yep. looking at. Okay. Um, we are here in South Africa and it's incredibly hot as you can see. <laughs> Former President Mandela once said, it always seems impossible until it's actually done. And in light of that I've actually got a little present for you. Which is something you can wear to the negotiations Thank just with that so quote Louise. So That's wear that proudly and think about that when you're <laughs> negotiating on behalf of Australia and the world. Thank you very much Clancy. It's a lovely thing and I will wear it proudly. Okay, bye bye. Cheers.